Hey there, I'm excited to announce this to you today. This is what you've been waiting for in your spiritual quest. This is something I've wanted to do for a long time, and I'm finally ready to announce it that it's ready to go. It's the Grief to Growth Community Circle. Now, this is a sanctuary where like-minded souls are united in their journey through grief and towards personal transformation. It's more than just a place. It's a beginning. It's a commitment to growth and understanding. Here you're finding not just a community, but you're entering a circle of trust and depth. You're going to engage with interactive coursework. You'll dive into exclusive podcast episodes and partake in discussions that illuminate the path from mourning to empowerment. This is a realm where every question is honored and every individual's journey is validated. To be part of this exclusive circle, visit us at grieftogrowth.com slash community or look for the chat icon at the bottom of every page on the main website. Remember that entry is a privilege because I want to ensure that every member is as dedicated and genuine as you are. You must apply to join, but the journey within is worth every step. So go ahead and join us today. Check it out, grieftogrowth.com slash community, and I look forward to seeing you there. Hi there. Welcome to Grief to Growth Podcast. Your host is Brian Smith, spiritual seeker, best-selling author, grief survivor, and life coach. Brian believes that the worst tragedies of life provide the greatest opportunity for growth. Brian says he was planted, not buried, and he is here to help you grow where you've been planted by the difficulties in life. In each episode, Brian and his guests will share what has helped them to survive and thrive. It is his sincere hope this episode helps you today. Welcome to the Donna Sebo Show. Donna is an international mental practitioner, psychic, award-winning author, counselor, speaker, teacher, and radio television talk show personality. She brings to the airwaves talented people from around the world who share their insights and experiences with you, the listening audience. Now, let's join Donna. Hello. Why, we're going to be talking about something tonight that's not easy for most people to discuss, and that's not a surprise. What is it? It deals with grief. There are many people today, right now, this moment, that are going through a grieving process of one type or another. And this is a very individual, personal experience There's no right way or wrong way of dealing with it. It's just something we have to get through. My guest this evening, Brian D. Smith, is a man who in 2015 entered into an experience with grief that in a million years he never, ever thought he would have to deal with. His book, Grief to Growth, Planted, Not Buried, How to Survive and Thrive After Life's Greatest Challenges. It's not a big book, but it's written from the heart, and it's written because he wants people to know, number one, they're not alone, and number two, he's more than happy to share his own story. Perhaps it will help someone you know, if not yourself. Brian Smith, welcome to the program. Thanks, Don. It's good to be here. Brian, what happened in 2015? Well, in 2015, my 15-year-old daughter, she was then 15, uh, her name is Shana. I uh, just returned from a volleyball trip. She played at a national level. She went to nationals uh, with her mother and she's been in Florida for a week. And We live in Ohio. And uh, we were went to wake her up on June 24, 2015, and Shana did not wake up. She had passed in her sleep. So it was uh, obviously quite a shock to us. She was a healthy girl. She was a uh, basketball player. She was a volleyball player. Uh, she was. She had just finished her freshman year of high school, and uh, she, as I said, she didn't wake up that day. So that started me. Well, that continued a journey that I've been on as, as far as uh, dealing with death and grief. But it, it really accelerated my my studies in into death and grief, and and ended up me where I, where I am today. Did they find out what happened to your daughter? She, I mean, at 15, that's the last thing you would expect. Yeah, you know, Donna, there's something called sudden unexplained uh, death of children, uh, SUDC, which I, I would say Shana probably falls into that category. She did have a mild heart condition called Wolf-Parkinson's-White syndrome, 
where her heart would race sometimes, but she had seen a cardiologist. She had had procedures. Uh, she had been cleared for sports. And that syndrome, if it were going to affect her, should have been during exercise, and she passed in her sleep. Uh, we did have a coroner's report, and the coroner said there was an abnormality in her heart. It was a congenital thing. Um, but it's really one of those, you know, totally unexplained things. It said she was, she was perfectly healthy as far as we concerned and, and played, you know, um, high school level of volleyball and basketball. Well, I can relate to what you're saying because I had a very special person in my life who was in their thirties and they laid down, went to sleep and they never woke up and they did an autopsy there and there was nothing they could find. It was a mystery. And I think it's a mystery to the family to this day. It does happen. Um, after after this happened with Shana, actually, we knew a girl. Um, she was a freshman at University of Cincinnati near us, and she same thing. She went to sleep and just didn't wake up. And after this happened to Shana, and I started talking to other parents, I found that it's it's fairly rare, but it happens. And and we often don't. There's there's no explanation for why it happens. It's just uh, it could happen to anyone at, at any age, but it does happen to children as well. It's very rare in my experience that men will talk about these things. Women seem to be more open about the grief, but you guys, it's really, really hard sometimes for you to really open up about it. When you were going through your grief, what was one of the most significant things for you that you found that you needed to do for yourself? Well, for me, Donna, my, my journey uh, started with the fear of death. Um, I, I feared death my, my entire, uh, from the time I was really a teenager. Um, so I had studied a lot about near-death experiences, uh, mediumship, um, afterlife communications, etc. So the one benefit I had when Shana passed was I, had, I, I didn't doubt where she was. I, I knew where Shana was, and I knew that Shana was okay. So that was a blessing for me. Um, so I had to deal with processing my own grief and understanding, you know, why did this happen and things of that nature. Uh, I was very fortunate that pretty quickly after she passed, someone referred to me. And there was a series of synchronicities that we don't have time to go into today. But I met all these people and then ended up finding an organization called Helping Parents Heal. And uh happened to be in Arizona where a couple of the founders lived on vacation, met with them, and my wife and I started volunteering with that organization. And so that that really helped me to heal myself. And I realized that, you know, Shana's passing served a purpose, and that purpose was for me to try to help other people. Well, I can I can really relate to that as well. I can understand that because in your little book, Grief to Growth, you really try to communicate in what I call down-to-earth language what grief is. And grieving very, very much involves the missing of the physical presence of that person in our lives, no matter who that individual may be. And I was intrigued that you gave some stats. You said that for people over 50 years of age, almost 12% have lost a child. For black people, the figure is nearly 17%. For white people, it's about 10%. And one in eight people over the age of 50 will have lost a child. And this, this is something that in our culture we don't seem to handle it as well as our ancestors did. Do you think that's because of a different patterning of lifestyle? What is it that you think makes it so hard for people to deal with death? Well, I think there's a number of factors. One is I think we've forgotten who we are, that we are actually eternal beings, and that there is no death. That's the first thing. So when you have the perspective that death is the cessation of, of a relationship and or a cessation of, of existence, it, it's terrifying. And so people don't want to face that. And we've, we've made death something that's separate. Uh, people typically buy, die in hospitals now, whereas they used to die alone. Um, it used to be if someone passed, we would bring the body back to the house, and they'd sit in the parlor for a couple of days. We'd have the funerals at home. 
We've got you know funeral parlors now. We take we we've we've really separated ourselves from from death, and we've tried to keep it away and and separate. So when you know, and I, I put the stats in the books there. I want people to understand that you know if you're a parent and you're going through this, it's okay. You're not alone, but you feel like you're alone because people don't talk about it. I was I was speaking with someone the other day whose son had passed almost two years ago, and she told me in their in their own family they don't say their son's name. Um, because they just haven't been able to to process their grief. So I think our society has really just kind of pushed it away because it's unpleasant, because it's ter- it's terrifying. It's terrifying to think that, that the person that we love has ceased to exist. I think that you're very correct with that. You bring up indifference. You say that grief can lead to a feeling of indifference. Explain that. Well, it, it, there's a there's a whole myriad of emotions that we go through with grief, and some people there's a misperception that it's a it's an orderly process, and they, they misuse Elizabeth Kubler's Ross five stages of dying, and they apply it to grief. And I've talked to so many people that in that first few weeks, they're like, I just don't feel anything. I feel numb. I feel like, you know, I feel there's something wrong with me because I don't I don't feel anything. And what that is is you're so over, so overwhelmed by the shock that your body and your mind are just able to process it. And often we've got to get through. We've got, we've got to deal with the funeral arrangements. We've got to deal with family. We've got to deal with all types of other things. So we kind of go into this kind of a robotic mode where our feelings shut down. So that, that feeling of indifference can come about. And then sometimes it's also a matter of, I don't care anymore. You know, I just, I just don't care because, you know, if, especially if it's a loss of a child, that we just, that's our entire life. And as, as a parent, when you, lose, when you lose a child, you feel like your life is just over. And that's a very natural reaction that comes about early in the process. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hey there, something I want to tell you about today. My podcast platform, Buzzsprout, has recently made it easier for me to allow you to support me financially. Go to www.grieftogrowth.com slash subscribe. That's grief, the number two, growth.com slash subscribe. And once you're there, you can sign up to support me financially. Now, you can do it for as little as $3 a month or, of course, as much as you'd like. If you do that, you'll get access to bonus episodes, and you'll see those in the regular feed. They'll have a lock on them. But when you become a subscriber, you'll actually get access to your own private feed, and you'll be able to listen to the regular podcast along with the bonus podcast for the subscribers. I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank you for sharing the podcast. And I want to thank those of you who support me financially. Have a great day and on to the episode. You have a chapter in your book, Grief to Growth, where you say what you can do about grief, take it head on. And you talk about a mom who, after her daughter died, the co-workers she worked with said she's too sad, she should go home, she shouldn't be here. And it just, it was something that was very difficult for the people around her to make it okay that she was grieving. Yes, yes. It's, people, again, they're uncomfortable around sadness. And we're taught in our society to put on a happy face, to, to suck it up and just to, you know, to, to you know, be happy. And people, they want to be around happy people. And they don't give, a lot of times they won't give a person permission to grieve. And I have heard over and over from parents, you know, a well-meaning person will say, oh, it's been six weeks. Aren't you over it yet? Oh, it's been six months. Aren't you over it yet? You know, a year, whatever. There is no timeline for getting over. First of all, we never get over it. Uh, we learn to carry it with us. We learn to deal with it, we, but we don't get over it. So, yeah, in that particular case, you know, this this woman's uh, boss called her in and said, you know, you're making people uncomfortable um, because this woman was naturally going through a process of grief. And so, unfortunately, a lot of times people will try to shut that process down, which it's going to come out at some point. So I encourage people to to take the grief head on, to feel the feelings, to feel the emotions, um, this mother I was talking with the other day, you know, the, who was who wouldn't mention her son's name. I said, you, 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 it, she was scared to cry. And I've heard people say, I'm scared to cry because if I start crying, I don't know if I'll ever stop. 
and I assure people you will stop. You can't, you won't cry forever and let's take small steps. So, you know, have a ritual that you go through where in in her case, she'd gotten letters from people about her son. I said, you know, just start opening up some of those letters and set aside a time where you're going to do that to just start kind of let these emotions flow through you. And if you let the emotions flow through you and process them, then you can, you can start to move forward with your grief and make it more bearable. I think those are wise words. You also mentioned how your wife went and embraced some of the things that you were doing. Your, what do you do, 10,000 steps a day? You meditated. You, you engaged yourself in certain environments with people. And some of the environments you had been in, you detached from because you were not finding the support and empathy that you needed. Yes. And this, I think, is extraordinarily important. Being around people that will allow you to just be yourself. Yes. Yes. Very important. I was I was very blessed. Um, you know, as I said, because of my fear of death, I studied you know all this stuff before. And I'd already started a meditation practice and et cetera. So I, I continued that and I really kind of doubled down on it. But my wife hadn't had that experience. And so she wasn't really, you know, well versed in, in death. You no, know, who, who wants to be? But I was fortunate that she started listening to the podcast that I was listening to and started doing, she started meditating. And we, we both joined helping parents, helping parents heal together as co leaders. And we, you know, so she's really, you know, uh, embraced that, that, understanding that that I have, which has helped us tremendously. And we were going to different churches, you know, at the time. And uh, we realized the one church we were going to just wasn't giving us what we needed. It wasn't, frankly, spiritual. It was it was just religious. And so we decided to switch to a church that was more open to the point of view that we had, which was a big part of our healing process. So uh, and then we got involved, as I said, with Helping Parents Heal, which is a community of parents who have children on the other side, and we have a particular view of our children's passing. You'll ha- rarely have me use the word died or dead, because while the physical body does die, and we can't deny that, the person doesn't die. The person continues on. And with Helping Parents Heal, we encourage people to continue the relationship with their children, to make their children a part of their life, which allows them to con- to continue on with their lives, frankly. And to actually, I've seen people get even stronger after their children die. Over a period of time, they become not the person they were before, but an even better, an even better version of themselves. Mm-hmm. I think experiences like that cannot help but make a change in a person. And what I like about your grief to growth was your honesty about what you went through and also the steps that you took. And it didn't happen in five minutes. We live in an environment at this time where people think that situations, conditions, emotions should be right there on top and everything should be settled in a nanosecond. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way at all. I don't care what you watch in the movies. It does not work that way. Now, you bring out something in your book that I think is very significant, and it is what not to say to someone who's in grief. Now, this, our cultural environment, people will have the passe statements, and you may or may not be comfortable with those passe statements, but the truth is Saying, I don't know what to say is okay, isn't it? Yes. Saying, I don't know what to say is actually one of the most thoughtful things you can say. Um, because it, 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 you're, you're, you're empathizing with the person and you're, and you're acknowledging the fact that you don't know what they're going through. Uh, and, and again, I particularly deal with child loss, especially someone who's lost a child, because it's so out of order. It's so unexpected. It's so shocking to our system, no matter who you are that unless you've lost a child, you really can't understand that. So by saying, I don't know what to say, you're acknowledging that person's pain without giving them some pat answer like, you know, God needed another angel or God needed them more than you do. Or, you know, believe it or not, people will say, well, you have other children. Um, You could have another baby, you know, things like that, that really can be more hurtful than they are helpful. 
Um, I don't. I don't want people to feel uncomfortable to say something. Um, but I, you know, as, as I've talked to so many people who have grieved, I can tell you some of those things just cut like a knife. I mean, they'll just say that that just really, um, you know, hurt me uh, to my core. Especially people, for for example, if you have faith and you, and someone says, "Well, God took your child because He needed them more," you know, God doesn't need my child more than I do. Um, so those things, they're well-meaning, but they can be harmful. Well, I think that perspective gives someone words to use, because often there is that feeling, gee, I don't know what to say. And I think that's mm-hmm. being very, very honest. Lots of times it's sometimes just holding someone's hand and mm-hmm. saying, I want you to know I care. And if you need me, give me a call, email me. Text me, whatever terminology you want to use. But I think expressing that you care is very, very important. I think that those that are left behind, when they know that someone cares, they're really not interested in any additional drama. They've got enough going on in their life at that moment. Mm -hmm. And I really think when you can just say, no, I'm here if you need me. But you also say something that I can recall this being done by many, many different people when I was growing up, and that is if you knew there had been a loss in the family, you took something over for them, or you would take a plant, you'd drop a card, but you let them know that you cared. Right. But you didn't want to invade their space. Yes, I think yeah, that's you want to be, respectful. Yes, I, I completely agree. You want to, you want to be respectful, but you want to let people know that you care. Um, and people people will say, "Well, meaning, you know, let me know if there's anything I can do for you." Well, well, that's really great, and that's a very caring thing to say. But that person at that time, you know, they're just their minds reeling. Several people said that to them. They can't remember who said what. So if you can think of something tangible, do a lot of people, frankly, brought us gift cards uh, for restaurants which was really nice because you don't feel like cooking and you, you can just go out or people were bring you know, people bring casseroles, but if, if someone had other children, you know, maybe watch their children for them so they can go out or something or, you know, any, you know, cutting their lawn, you know, things like that, that are, that are small things that let people know their care. And it takes some of those day to day burdens off, especially again, in those first few weeks or months. And another thing I would encourage people is, you know, everybody gathers around, for the first two or three or four weeks, and then everybody forgets, and they'll go back to their lives. So what, um, I had a really good friend that her husband passed, you know, like over, over the summer, and what I said to her was, you know, I will give you a call in a few weeks. Once everybody else has gone away, then you and I will talk. So be that person, that, that second wave after everybody's forgotten, be that person that comes in at that point because that's, that's when they're going to be lonely. That's a very good point. That is a very, very good point. I recall a friend who is who died a few years back, and I'll never forget the year when her son was killed. She never got over it, ever. But we mm-hmm. did reach a point, because we were such good friends, that we were able to talk about her son, and we mm-hmm. were able to discuss certain things. And sometimes you just have to be a good listener and make it okay that that person is going through the grief because many, many times people have guilt. And whether it's justified or not, they have all of these emotions that are inside of them. And they're just as afraid of those emotions because they think they're a bad person because they have them. And they're not. Yes. Yes. Well, the guilt, again, especially with parents losing children, is almost universal. And it doesn't matter how the child uh, transitioned, whether they took their own life, whether they were in an accident, if they were a grown, if they were an adult, if they were a baby, we, we, as parents, I guess we want to feel guilty. I mean, it's really weird. People seem to cling to that, that guilt. So one of the things I have to do when I'm working with parents is almost universally is release them from that guilt. And I'll, I'll, I'll ask, I'll tell them, you, you, you're not omniscient, you're not omnipotent. You, you're not omnipresent. You can't be everywhere all the time. You could not predict what was going to happen. But that's a very, that's a universal feeling. So 
as we're going through it, if you're the person going through the grief, release that from yourself because the grief is bad enough without the, without the guilt. Uh, if you know someone that's going through that, then help them understand that they did the best that they could do with what they knew at the time. And the other people have agency. We can't control what other people do. Um, but I, I've had I've had parents that were guilty about grown children, 30, 37 year old person that was killed by a drunk driver, and the mother blamed herself for not being there. Um, you know things that are, uh, you know, we just we just seem to want to cling to that. So I, I would just encourage people to try to let that go, and then you can deal with the grief, you know, on its own. Brian, you dealt with your grief. And as you mentioned earlier, sometimes the grief kicks in at different times. You talk about triggers. What were some of the mm. triggers for you? Oh, wow. It could be anything. It could be a song on the radio. It could be a, a good thing. It could be a bad thing. I remember one time I was driving over to see my grief counselor. It was a beautiful day. It was uh, toward the end of June or July. The sun was out. Listening to the radio on my car. I was just having a really happy moment. And then I thought about my daughter not being there to share that moment with me. That was a trigger. Uh, driving by the first restaurant, fast food restaurant I took her to, uh, the first few times I drove by there because it's near our house, you know, that would trigger me. Um, as I said, you know, it could be a particular song on the radio. It could be uh, the sound of an ambulance um, will trigger people. Uh, so that it could be almost anything. And that's the thing about triggers. They can come, you know, at almost any time. And, I, again, I encourage people to lean into those things because I know some people that say, well, I won't, I won't drive that stretch of highway because that's where the accident was. Or I won't drive by this or I won't even visit a certain city because it, it triggers me. Um, but you can't avoid all of them. Um, it, it, it's just impossible. So um, it gets less and less. I still live in the same house where, where Shana passed and I still drive by the restaurant that, that used to upset me when I drove by it. Uh, it's been almost five years now, and when I drive by it, I remember when she was five years old, and I took her there, and it's a happy memory. Mm-hmm. What are some of the other techniques that you yourself have employed in your environment, in your daily life, to help you get through those memory moments that you just described? Well, it's really, uh, it's a whole practice, and I, I, I cover some of the things in the book. You cover a couple of them. I, I meditate daily, uh, sometimes twice a day. I, I take a hour and a half walk every day. Um, during that walk, I'm either walking, in, I walk in silence for a while just to reflect on, what you know, just, just a, as a kind of a walking meditation. Then I'll listen to uplifting music or I'll listen to podcasts. I listen to, I really am trying to program myself, frankly, it's countercultural, so I'm trying to maintain my relationship with my daughter. I'm trying to understand that that I am a you know a a spiritual uh, person having a human experience, and I'm and not the other way around. That everything here is temporary. Uh, frankly, one of the things it may sound morbid to some people, but I look forward to seeing my daughter again. I'm not trying to rush that, but it's something that that gives me a drive to move forward. Um, and frankly, when Shana first passed, I didn't want to be here. Um, uh, and I didn't think I wanted to heal. And when people talk to me about it, I'm like, I, I don't, I don't know if I want to get over this. And I can say, I, I can tell people now when you feel that way in the beginning, and I think most parents do, you can work through that. And as you said, some people, the rest of their life, they're, they're, ne they never, um, well, we never get over it, but they never start to heal. And I tell people you can heal and it's okay to heal. And your child or your, or your loved one, they love you. They want you to heal. They're still with you, and they don't want to see you sad for the rest of your life. And it doesn't serve any purpose. And it doesn't mean you love them anymore if you decide to shut your life down. Um, so go ahead and live your life with purpose. Live your life with meaning. My, my daughter is my partner. And when I do my, uh, my calls, I do them on Zoom, and I have my daughter's pictures in my background. And so people, you know, ask me, is that my daughter? I was like, yeah, she's my partner. She's literally right there all over my shoulder all the time. So she motivates me in, in everything that I do. And she's, she's literally my partner. Your website is helpingparentsheal.org. Now, is this an organization that you have established, or is it one that was already present and you work with them? 
Uh, HelpingParentsHeal.org is a, an organization that I volunteer with. It was started by a woman named Elizabeth Boisson. Uh, it's, a, it's an international organization. I think we're up to about probably 12,000 members now. Uh, we have an online Facebook group that's about 5,600 members. So I'm just I'm a, a volunteer and a board member with Helping Parents Heal. Um, that's that's not my organization, but I, I my my website is Grief to Growth. So it's Grief the Number Two Growth dot com. You, but uh, I work very very closely with Helping Parents Heal. In fact, I was on three meetings with them today. My goodness! Now you started a blog too after your daughter died. What's that all about? I did. It was kind of like, it was really weird, Donna. I mean, I think it was literally like a day or two after Shana passed. I just got this idea. I need to chronicle this journey. So I started like day one and I would, I would uh, for the first couple of years, I wrote every day. I don't write every day in the blog anymore, but I labeled it day by day because I wanted to chronicle my grief journey. And it's just what happens to me during the day, signs that she sent to me, um, the things that I discovered, you know, uh, podcast, anything that can help other people on the, along the way. I guess it kind of would be kind of a, a breadcrumb trail for other people to follow if they were so inclined. Um, and it, may, it was actually, I, I may one day turn that into some sort of book. I don't know. But uh, the blog is still there, and uh, it's still part of my Grief to Growth website. And if people want to read it, some people do follow it. Uh, it it's still there. When you decided to write this book, what was it like for you? Well, I felt like um, after all the studying I'd done, I studied, you know, afterlife for about 20 years before Shana passed. And at that point, I had been volunteering with Helping Parents Heal for probably about three years, uh, talking to other parents. And I wanted to write something that was very frank about what grief is. And I wanted first people, all people understand what it is. And I also wanted to give people techniques to help. I never want to present a problem without presenting a solution. I never... And, I always, in every encounter I have with people, I want to leave them with hope. So the purpose of the book was to tell people, here's what you're going to experience. It's different for everybody. It's unique. But these are some of the general things you're going to experience. And when you're going through it, it doesn't mean you're crazy. And you will get through it. And, you, you know, you will, you will not necessarily get over it, but you'll learn to carry it with you. And I use the analogy, if you lift a weight, a you know, 25-pound weight, when you first start lifting it, it's very heavy. But after a while, you build up the strength and you can carry it easier. And that's the way grief is. We're, we're always going to carry it with us, but it becomes easier and easier to carry. And I want people to know that you're not going to return to the person that you were, but you could be, you can choose to be an even better and an even stronger person. Brian, I want to thank you very much for being with me. Brian Smith, his website is Grief to Growth, and it's the number two, Grief, Mm -hmm. the number two, and growth.com. And you'll find out information about his blog, et cetera. And Planted, Not Buried, How to Survive and Thrive After Life's Greatest Challenges. Brian D. Smith, thank you so much for being my guest. Donna, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Well, I hope you enjoyed the episode. I want to make it really easy for you to reach me. So just send me a text to 31996 and simply text the word growth, G-R-O-W-T-H. In fact, you can right now just say, hey, Siri, send a message to 31996. And when Siri asks you what you want to send, just say growth. You can do the same thing with OK Google. Thanks a lot. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for listening to Grief to Growth. Brian hopes that you find this episode helpful and will come back for future episodes. Brian's best-selling book, Grief to Growth, Planted Not Buried, is a great resource for anyone who is coping with grief or knows someone who is. If you enjoy the podcast and would like to support it, there are three things you can do to help. The first is to share the podcast with someone that you think it will help. The second is to go to iTunes, rate, and review the episode. The third way you can support the podcast is by becoming a patron. Head over to www.patreon.com slash grief to growth. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash grief, the number two, growth, and sign up to make a small monthly donation. Patrons get access to exclusive bonus content and knowledge that you are helping to spread the message of grief to growth. For more about Brian and grief to growth, visit www.grief2growth.com. 
Hi there. I hope you enjoyed this latest episode of the podcast, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. What questions came up for you? What did you like about it? What didn't you like about it? I invite you to visit us at grief growthcircleso That's grief the number 2 growthcircleso to continue the conversation with me and with other listeners. It's a space to sound off, to share reactions, and to go deeper into the topics from the show. I look forward to chatting more, and I hope to see you there.